Well, welcome to Stami Talks, a podcast about fertilizer technology. Uh, today we have an episode with uh, Jesus Gonzalez um, about uh, digitalization. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Schrijzer. Uh, welcome, Jesus. Um, Hey Mark, thank you very much for having me here and uh, good morning. Yeah, I'm glad that you are on the on this podcast. So uh, and today we're going to talk about the digitalization, of course, especially in in, in fertilizer plants. Yeah. Um, first of all, for the audience, uh, what is digitalization and how does it work with with fertilizer plants? Well, uh, digitalization can be defined, I think, in a, a three steps. So we have the digitization, which basically consists into turning your uh, physical data so pen and paper data and uh, turning, uh, putting into the computer, so uh, digital data, let's say. Digitalization is the use of this uh, data and also digital tools and digital uh, services to enhance your process, to have a better, uh, higher efficiency, to have more safe environments. And uh, I think the next step, which is already happening, is the digital transformation, which is put these processes, these digital uh, tools and technologies at the core of your business. And in the uh, uh, fertilizer industry, mainly for uh, plant operators and, uh, and uh, plant owners, has to do with having the plants running efficiently and, uh, and in a safe way. Okay, and and your role in that because hey, we've invited you as, uh, as because you're part of our digital yeah. team. But what, what's your what's your day-to-day work? What do you do? Well, I've been involved in uh, creating the operator training simulators. I'm also vol- involved in, uh, in innovation as part, as you said, of uh, STAMI Digital. In my case, not on the software department, but on the digital projects department. Okay, that's nice. So, and w- what what got you into that career? How did it start for you? Well, I mean, I've always been into computers. I still remember when I was a kid and my father playing computer uh, video games and uh, uh, always with the computer, so I was always uh, hooked by it. And since then, I, uh, I always like it a lot. So uh, when I did my chemical engineering studies, I uh, did my PhD and then started seeing that possibility of combining both worlds. Eh? Okay. So I still work on the process industry, but at the same time, I uh, use a lot of computers and it kept on growing until uh, yeah, I arrived at the Stami Digital. So a chemical PhD and a lot of uh, digital experience as well. It's, uh, yeah. it's a very <laughs> nice uh, nice combination. And how, how do you, because you say you work in digital projects, so um, I assume that you realize uh, projects for digitalization projects for, for clients. Yeah. Is that for uh, all kinds of digitalization possible? Because you said uh, those are the three steps. Are you uh, three steps of digitalization? I'm assuming you're not working on the digitalizing paper. Uh, no, no. <laughs> That's already taken for granted that uh, yeah. the companies already have this. It's not always true. But uh, no, the part where we work is on digital products and services. Mainly is the operator training simulator and the uh, STEMI digital process monitor. Those are the main products we have. And okay. then services on training and consultancy and uh, maintenance of these products as well. Okay. And so, and what's the, the challenge? Because you, you've said those two products are the, the training simulator, operating training simulator and uh, mm-hmm. Process monitor. What are the? Uh, why would anyone want to have this? Well, it depends on the product uh, itself. But for a plant uh, owner, the way I see it, what they want is their plant to run as efficient as possible for the longest time, to have very short stops because every time the plant is stopped, it's not producing, and they want to produce the most possible. And of course, with safety. Eh? So they they don't want any accidents or malfunctions. And even if they occur, they want to be able to foresee them and uh, and uh, react well to them so that the effects are minimized. That's the main reason why they would like to adopt uh, either an operator simulator or a STAMI digital process monitor. Okay, so you've got basically two two products that both uh, work towards the same goal goals. I should say in a different way. Yeah, I mean the operator simulator at the end of the day, what it uh, gives to the plant owner and to the to the plant is better trained operators. And that translates into a higher efficiency on running the plant because, of course, if they have to carry out a startup and they can carry it faster, mm-hmm. that means the plant is producing for uh, more time. And also on safety. They get to know better the plant. They know what can happen. They have trained on seldom occurring situations and know how to react, and that makes operation uh, much yeah. safer. And, and what type of training exercises do you implement then? Well, that's always in coordination with the client, depending on what their experience is, what they think is interesting, and also, of course, uh, for a fertilizer industry, based on the knowledge that we have in uh, in house, there is simple uh, scenarios such as, for example, that uh, a valve fails or that uh, there is an offset on a sensor and they have to react to to that, 
or more complex scenarios such as the fouling on heat exchanger that basically is that there's a certain blocking at the tubes of a heat exchanger and therefore the duty decreases. Well, the operators need to figure out what's going on and detect what's causing it and take corrective action. Eh? You can have uh, tubes breaking, you can have uh, a lot of different possibilities that can be implemented. Okay. Is there anything you can't do yet? Might be, but we still need to figure <laughs> out it. <laughs> okay, so so far you haven't encountered a, a client request. It's about, this is, so basically the um, uh, uh, startup uh, failures, I think then it's about uh, pumps uh, breaking, pipes breaking, all that stuff you can yeah. integrate. So uh, uh, with the OTS, basically, as let's say not the scenarios, but main operating modes are um, the startup uh, running the plant in operation, change the load and the shutdown. But then also we can implement a lot of scenarios. We have the standard ones we have, and I think that to the moment we have not encountered a scenario that the client wants and is not able to uh, to implement. Okay. And do you have any uh, thoughts on, because uh, clients as well, there's an obvious a need for a client to to have this uh, better trained staff uh, improves efficiency and provides uh, better safety. Is there any um, sort of efficiency gain in that? Is that measurable? Or is it just a, a gut feeling? It's difficult to measure it uh, properly, of course, because it's difficult to measure how uh, how much efficiency brings to have better trained operators. Uh, for the downtime, we have estimations eh, that can be couple of days uh, uh, lower uh, downtime than you have in your plant uh, per year. Okay. But again, it's more uh, of a gut feeling and also feedback from the clients, asking them and see if they use the OTS, uh, how much they use it and what advantages do they see. Okay, so a couple of, of days of operation is the the, the sort of the efficiency gain, production gain from the better but trains. From, the, from the downtime, yeah. Then, of course, if you think about an accident, if you avoid it, well, that's, that's yeah, what the price is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, could could save lives. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And so, and the uh, and how does it? Is there a link between? Um, because then you've got trained staff. Yeah. Um, how does that reflect? Or does it integrate with the? You said the process monitor as as other main product. Yes, I mean digital process monitor is a digital twin. It's a concept that I think was introduced in two thousand two or two thousand, and. Uh, it does not. It does integrate in the same detail strategy. I would say it's not that they are connected each product with each product. Eh? Okay, but it does integrate uh, because uh, uh, yeah, it's a digital twin. So effectively, what we have is a virtual counterpart to the reality. In this case, we might have a steady state model, uh, a simulation of the plan, so that if we provide inputs, then it's able to calculate uh, internal variables and uh, and also more like a KPIs. And it integrates in the sense that it also adds efficiency to your uh, plant operation because it gives you information you cannot just get from the plant. It gives you some insights on the plant that allows you to take uh, like decisions. Like well, a uh, good example, I mean, I have a couple of them, but one of them would be the KPI, so key performance indicators on the plant, what your energy consumption is overall, uh, what your load is, what your efficiency, emissions, all those indicators that are very general in the whole uh, in the whole plant and that allow pl plants operators uh, to realize how the plant is operated. Do they want to be there? Do they want to switch to a... But you have all of these in real time then? or how does Yes, it yes, it's connected in real time. Uh, I don't know exactly, I mean, it's not every second. I think it's a bit uh, uh, longer, but I think it's a matter of each minute or so. Okay. The data from the plant is sent to the digital twin. It calculates and provides in a dashboard, so on a fancy computer with uh, a good visualization method. Uh, it provides this information. Eh? KPIs, it can also be used for a fault prediction, for example, which is quite interesting, I think. Okay. Why is it interesting? Well, it's interesting because uh, if there's going to be a malfunction, you want to know it in uh, in advance. Eh? Yeah. Uh, effectively, the way it works is uh, it compares the data from the DCS and compares the data that is calculated uh, at the digital twin and detects an anomaly. Uh, if you are not detecting that while you are operating the plant, it means that the problem has not consolidated and you still need to operate like that for a while until you see something is going wrong. So yeah. it might take some hours. Whereas if you have this tool, uh, it might, you might catch it much earlier. So the problem does not consolidate, you take the corrective action and you save, I don't know, several hours of uh, going to that problem and then coming back to proper operation. Okay, so also then, but I th then I think it depends, of course, on the problem, but that could be a, a leakage and a major malfunction yeah, yeah. as well. It could be a valve that should have been closed and has been left open by mistake or uh, or anything, yeah. Yeah, okay, but so, uh, you said linking it to the uh, to the DCS. 
So, die OTS, ja. Uh, en de OTS of de DCS? Uh, 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 link it to the product uh, OTS or link it, uh, no uh, the, the data to is link exactly to the DCS to okay. the distributed control system yes so, so then you get data from the plant and then where does this model run how does it how does it work does it run in the cloud or is it local what what are the, the it runs on the cloud yes yes we have it on the on the cloud so effectively that data is automatically gathered from the DCS then is sent to the digital twin uh, part of that data is inputs like for example the the feedstock uh, the flow rate uh, composition, temperature, pressure, etc. That is what is the input for the model. The model that has been uh, created in-house with the knowledge that we have, our uh, thermodynamics and uh, kinetics and very advanced models, runs and calculates uh, calculates the steady state for the plant. And therefore, it can compare between the data from the DCS with the data of the model and, and, and see if it's consistent and uh, okay. get information out of it. But I can imagine that not all clients would be willing to to share DCS data with uh, with Stami. How, how does that work? Well, I'm, uh, I imagine that can happen. Also, sometimes they are not so trusting on the safety of or the security of that data management. Okay. But uh, that is taken cover. I think it is taken care here at Stami Carbon. Um, we have uh, uh, partners that are very uh, uh, experienced on handling data in a safe way, both for uh, uh, having the data stored and also to transfer the data. And we just recently got uh, the ISO 27001, uh, which is about uh, data security and data management. So uh, safety is guaranteed. Uh, how is it handled? Then I, I imagine something that is taken care by legal on yep. uh, what kind of obligations each part has, but on a, on a secure way for sure. Yeah, so in principle, there's nobody else actually uh, no. uh, accessing the data from uh, from a client. Exactly. Okay, and so um, you said there also the the link between OTS, uh, the training simulator, and the process monitor. Then, if you get information from the DCS, I think I'm assuming you could also get information from the OTS. Get yes. that into the. Is there a a, a benefit in doing so? Well, it has been used as a proof of concept, as a demonstration. Yeah, at the end of the day, the operator training simulator very accurately simulates the plant. So mm. you have the whole uh, uh, whole process, the chemistry and the physics uh, there. And also the distributed control system, the DCS is simulated. So effectively, you have a, a game that simulates a plant. Uh, so if you link it to uh, uh, to your uh, digital twin, to your uh, process monitor, then you have a very good proof of concept. You can try things, you can uh, experiment with it. You say a game, so then we'll get back to your, your father, right? <laughs> so, that, so then I'm just thinking about this. So basically it's possible to, if, if you have those those two in a link together, you could get a uh, bragging contest between operators and see who performs yeah. the best. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, that's yes. That's it's like. kind of, if I think uh, for the OTS, uh, a good analogy that has always been used is the flight simulator because it, it yeah. is effectively the same thing. Eh? You have uh, instead of a pilot that uh, you don't want to put try things on a Boeing seven four seven, you have an operator that you don't want to put on a on a real plant to try things. So you get a very very advanced and a good uh, video game, and they can train there. Yeah. So you say you had a very very advanced and very uh, you said high fidelity, I think. Or yes, high, high fidelity. Accuracy? Yeah. What does that mean? What what is is it just how it looks or how does it what what is it and what's high what's low how does it, what's it's a combination so high fidelity uh, from the process point of view it means uh, higher than ninety eight percent accuracy okay which lo- usually is much higher than that effectively what it means is that for any situation that uh, you have your plant and you have your uh, OTS for each of the tags that is for each of the sensors you have. Uh, the error is lower than 2%. And as I say, it's usually much lower than 2%. That's important because you want the plant to behave the same as, so the OTS to behave the same as the plant. Yeah. And on the other hand, we have the, the, the look and feel, the same look and feel. So that uh, what you see and how it behaves uh, has a similar or very close to uh, to how the actual plant behaves. Going to the the, the analogy of the pilot again, you could run the pl- flight simulator on a computer, but they usually also build the cockpit uh, ah, or a yeah. model of the cockpit so that they get used and they get this kind of uh, muscle memory on where things are. Oh, yeah, okay. So I think on the other side, so if you would have a uh, high graphic um, accuracy but a low model accuracy, you it could look like a real cockpit. Yeah. But yeah. but it would fly like, but it would fly like a tank. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's also important, the collaboration with the client. At the end of the day, all the OTSs, when they are high fidelity, they are customized mm -hmm. to each specific plant. So you cannot just take a, a generic one to train, mainly because you usually don't want your operators to be trained on a generic plant and know how to operate the generic plant. You want them to operate your plant. Yeah, exactly. So it's collaboration with them, uh, ask of uh, information that they possess, and uh, that is used to uh, to make a very... Yeah, customize uh, OTS. Okay, and that sounds that sounds very interesting. So, so how does this develop in the future? Where, where does digitalization head next? Because there, of course, there's lots of currently, of course, artificial intelligence is uh, very hot. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot going on, as you said, and depending on the on the industry, is uh, be more implemented and not. And depending on the technology, there's also more hype. I mean, now we have the hype with ChatGPT. Uh, some years ago was the, the hype with the autonomous car. Uh, but definitely it's going in that direction. Eh? We see, I think, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are potentially will have a lot of applications also in our sector. And if we look at data science, machine learning, and the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, uh, I think there's a lot of future in there. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you where do you see that impact on the sector? If you have that some concrete expectation in mind, so where where does a plant? What does a plant look like in 2030? Or is it still a, sort of a general direction? And we'll, we'll see where we end up. I cannot foresee how it's going to be. I think from what I'm hearing and the potential that I see on those tools is going to be a huge impact, but I don't know exactly uh, how. At the end of the day, um, what I think will happen is that plants will be generating even more and more data, and that data will be used by these trained models. You can have your machine learning models and get to learn from this data, the historians on the plant, uh, data from the inspections, and gather more and more data and use it. To first, I imagine, to monitor the plant as well. They can help you monitor the plant and give you advice on how to operate and non operators in between. At some point, might it be that it, uh, I mean, we are talking about the autonomous car, why not the autonomous plant to a certain extent? But that I think is more into the very far future. And yeah, I think that's also, uh, if you talk about the, the, the risk aversion exactly. of the chemical industry, <laughs> of course, uh, I think also even for, for cars, I think that's a. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about that for I think a decade or so now. So uh, if we start to talk about autonomous plants now, then I think uh, <laughs> let's talk again uh, in twenty thirty three or something. Some or even about longer, it. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah because but it has a huge potential there. I mean, not not in, yeah. in this direction, but it. Um, I think then the potential, because my assumption would be then that if it if a plant would really run uh, autonomously, uh, then it would be more consistent, and you will get all those upset yeah. conditions. Yeah, I mean, the, the as I said, this is more like a science fiction at this yeah. moment, but um, if you think humans can process data, but imagine a uh, DCS is producing, what, uh, 1,000 points of data per second? There's no way humans are going to go through the 1,000 points of seconds every second. That machine learning can, that can use all that data and, and find correlations, uh, properly built and properly trained. So um, that's already one advantage that you can, make use of all this huge amount of data that otherwise we would have problems too. We need to make graphics and things to visualize it that machine learning doesn't doesn't need that. Eh? And a, a good uh, uh, an, again, analogy is the, the, the self-driving car. If you see it, eh, it can handle a lot of different sensors. It's not only bounded to your uh, sight and, uh, and, and hearing. It can have infrared sensor. It can have anything else. Uh, for the plant, the way I see it is the access to all that data and the capability of uh, making something out of it. Okay, so then I think then the outcome would be that indeed uh, even more uh, increased safety, even more increased efficiency. Yeah, predictive maintenance, for example, to be able to predict when a certain equipment is going to fail so that you can plan for a proper uh, uh, maintenance or for a proper uh, change of the equipment. Instead of operating the plant and find out the equipment is failing, then I have to stop my plant for, uh, what, one month until I replace it. So th those things will add a lot of value because only one time that something like this is predicted and averted to happen during operation, that means a lot for a, yeah. for a plant. Oh, exciting, exciting times to uh, to come. It's, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Wow, it's, uh, well, th thanks a lot for sharing your your experience and, and your, your insight into what's, uh, what's coming next in the digital world. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very interesting and uh, well, for sure we'll, we'll talk more about the digitalization in future episodes of this uh, this podcast. Great to hear and thank you very much for uh, for having me here. Yeah, well, most welcome. Thanks, uh, Jesus. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody also for uh, for listening and uh, stay tuned for uh, next episodes. Thank you for listening to Stami Talks. 